Good evening, everyone. I'm Jin Zhao Li again, Director of Cambridge China Center. A very warm, warm welcome to everybody joining us online today. And Cambridge China Center, the Confucius Institute for Business London and Wine Peak are very proud to present a Nota Mandarin Wine Club, a webinar series hosted fortnightly on Sundays by Cambridge alumna Janet Wang, um, the author of the Chinese Wine Renaissance. A Nota Mandarin Wine Club is your unique chance to learn more about China, its history, culture, people, and the market, the land, all conducted in a fun and relaxed setting, supplemented by virtual wine tasting. Should you wish to have a glass at hand while joining us on the online sessions. Season one of A Nota Mandarin Wine Club runs from today, the 11th October to the 20th December, six sessions in total, all delving into the world of Chinese wine culture and wine regions. Today is session one of season one, and Jenny will take us on an exciting journey of thousands of years of history of Chinese wine, which you may not know. And I have got my wine here at hand already. And without further ado, let's welcome Jenny Wang and let's all enjoy our time at a Northern Mandarin Wine Club online, Janet. Thank you. Thanks, Jing Zhao. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our first session um, about Chinese wines um, in particular. So we're going to look at um, today the history uh, of Chinese wines. And then in the following uh, sessions, we'll look at specific regions uh, of the modern Chinese wine industry. Uh, so quickly, I'll share my slides with you. Um, yeah. So, so today, um, a brief history of Chinese wine. Um, some of you might not realize that China um, has a very ancient history of grape wine making. So we're not just talking about rice wine or grain wine or uh, distilled liquor, right? Uh, which is what we usually associate China with. But today we're going to talk specifically about the history of grape wine in China. So Zhongguo, Putao Jiu, Jian Shi. Putao Jiu is grape wine. So Jiu in Chinese, um, uh, although we translate Jiu to, 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 um, to mean wine, but um, I think in Europe, uh, in English or in European languages, wine tend to mean grape wine by default, whereas the word jiu in Chinese can uh, encompass all type of alcoholic beverages, right? So pu tao jiu in particular is what we're talking about, which is grape wine. So um, you might have heard, um, usually we, we hear about the oldest wine found in the world um, is around the Middle East, you know, the, the fertile crescent part of the world. But actually, the oldest archaeological finding uh, of fermented beverages at the moment is actually in China, right? So it's found in Jiahu Wenhua. Uh, it's a, a Leonithic, um, Neolithic site uh, in Henan province. And this um, they found a pot containing liquid, containing wine, uh, that dates around 9,000 years ago, right? And they did some chemical uh, analysis uh, and uh, dating, and um, um, the, the content um, is actually made mostly with fruit. So it could be wild grapes uh, or hawthorn, and there's a bit of a trace, uh, traces of grains as well, and possibly mead, uh, honey. Right, so it's a it's a blend for sure, but there's a, certainly um, a lot of fruit contents in that. And one thing to know also is um, when we talk about uh, uh, wine grapes, we usually talk about the European uh, uh, wine uh, vine species, right? Uh, the Vitis vinifera. So that's a European uh, species. But actually, um, if we look at the Vitis fa family the overall big family where the grape vines come from, China is actually home to over half of the world's um, uh, grape vine species, right? So China has a very ancient, um, uh, well, it's a home to a, a lot of wild grape uh, varieties, right? So it's no surprise that we, we may find very ancient uh, wild grapes 
being made into one. So that's the first thing uh, to, to note. Um, if you want to find out more, I also put some references in my, uh, in my book. So if you want to later read a little bit more about what we cover, um, I will also have some further reading suggestions along the way today as well. Um, so yeah, so you'll see this uh, reference as well. Um, this is a very interesting record, uh, ancient record called the Book of Odes. This is where uh, we first encounter written record uh, talking about grapes and talking about wine. Um, so this particular poem is taken from the Book of Odes, um, which um, is the first anthology of Chinese poetries uh, that cover a period of um, 300 to 500 years. Um, and it's dated around first millenn millennium BC, right? called Shi Jing. Shi Jing. And um, this particular poem called Guo Feng, Bing Feng, Qi Yue, it's describing a, um, a calendar year, an agricultural calendar year, in terms of um, the, the type of um, fruits and uh, grains that you might harvest at particular points in the year and what you do with them. So this poem is really insightful in terms of the ancient agricultural practices uh, of China. So here, uh, you, you, um, what, what's noticeable, uh, notable for us is the mention of grape and it's associated with a sixth month, but actually it means um, around August time. So it says in around August time, uh, we may harvest the grapes, uh, wild grapes, um, but that is to be eaten, right? So this poem very specifically says uh, around August time, we eat grapes, right? And then it, it goes on to say around uh, the 10th month, we bring in the grains, you know, we harvest the rice, and then we use that to make spring wine. So what's interesting here is the distinguish, uh, distinction between grapes for eating and grains for making wine. So we can, um, we can get the sense that actually um, grapes are still fairly uh, wild, I suppose, whereas grains are much more uh, cultivated at that time in China. So, um, and trenjiu, trenjiu is spring wine. And um, basically it is wine that's made um, around winter time after the, after the grain harvest. And then it's aged over uh, the winter and brought out again um, for spring uh, or around the, um, the, 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 um, the, the spring festival time, I suppose. Uh, so trenjiu. Um, is a concept that in China, um, that's very common um, in ancient China and also historically uh, to mean uh, wine for springtime. And then later on, it evolved into wine for the spring festival. Um, and, then, and then the poem goes on to say, we use this wine to wish the bushy eyebrowed one a long life, right? So here it's basically saying that the wine is used to pay tribute or to pay respect to an elder senior person of the community and to wish him longevity, right? So already you can see that wine is associated with certain health giving or uh, health preserving properties, All right? So even back in around first millennium um, BC, you can already tell that people have these um, um, very specific ideas about how wine should be made and how wine is served. Uh, so this is a very insightful um, piece of poetry. It's a written record um, of uh, grape, <laughs> for starters, for eating, and uh, grains to make wine. So when does grape make an appearance to um, become a, 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 a sort of wine ingredient? So in the meantime, in Europe, right? Vitis vinifera is already being used to make wine. So around the time of Shi Jing, the Book of Odes, talking about grape for eating and rice to make wine, in Europe, um, you're already seeing um, the, um, the European grape variety um, being spread around the Mediterranean area. So Ojo Niangjiu Futao is what we still today um, most associate uh, with the, um, the wine grapes. But in China, um, 
wine made from grapes start to make an appearance around um, the Han Dynasty. So second century BC, uh, when Han Wu Di, um, Emperor Han, uh, Emperor Wu Di of Han, sent out an envoy headed by Zhang Qian to, uh, to go westwards to find out um, who, who is out there, are they allies or are they foes? You know, can we establish um, uh, alliances with them uh, for defense and for trade purposes, right? So he sent out this envoy to go westwards and discover what's out there. So the first mention um, of wine comes from this region um, that I've circled here in red called Fagana. Fagana in, in um, the Han Dynasty time, they called it Da Yuan. Da Yuan. So this area, Fagana, um, is uh, today in um, part of Uzbekistan, that sort of area. So Wu Di of Han um, sent out an envoy, envoy headed by Zhang Qian, and um, his journeys and his findings are recorded um, in, uh, by Sima Qian who was the court historian. And he is most famous for uh, this book called Shi Ji. Shi Ji is uh, the records of the grand historian. So it's a really important his historical text um, of China um, dating back to the Han Dynasty. So here in Shi Ji, um, it is recorded um, around Da Yuan, grapes are used for wine. Right, and the Han envoy brought back specimens. And the emperor was the first to plant it. So this is very specifically written in, in a, an official historical record that uh, grapes uh, were brought back to make wine and the emperor was very interested. And Han Wudi was known to have a really, uh, a really uh, wanted to cultivate uh, grape wines around his palace, right? So he then uh, imported not just grapes, but also wine and also winemakers. So all this technology uh, came from Europe uh, through the Silk Road into China uh, around the second century BC. And that's the first mention uh, of grape wine in, a, in an official historical record. And Book of Han, uh, which is another um, uh, official record of Han Dynasty history. Again, it says uh, around Da Yuan, there are lots of uh, grapes being made into wine and the rich families, um, they would uh, store a lot of this um, at home, you know, up to 200,000 liters uh, of wine, they would store it. And some of these would keep for decades. Right? So already we can see that wine can age pretty well and people know that and they do store it um, and up to uh, several decades and, and enjoy it. Um, so again, this is very interesting. And we also know around this time, um, uh, wines from Greece, for example, is um, much loved. And Da Yuan, this region um, is said to be uh, occupied by uh, Greek descendants as well. So again, you can see influences all the way from uh, from Europe um, into China through the Silk Road. So yes, in, in the meantime, we've got um, Cato the Elder, right? He's writing about viticulture around this time and uh, about how to cultivate vines and how to, um, uh, what sort of medicinal qualities that wines uh, possess um, in his uh, the Agricultura. So uh, Cato the Elder, Lao Jia Tu in Chinese. So it is basically um, already um, studying and compiling um, writing uh, to, to formalize, you know, uh, viticultural practices. But around this time during the Han Dynasty, uh, although grape wines have been introduced to China, it's very, very rare, you know, this is the um, completely the reserve of royalties of the elite, you know, of the court. Grapes um, are very rare, they're very valuable, and wine made from grapes are even more so. So 
throughout the Han Dynasty, grape wine, grape wine is not really accessible to the common people. Um, and towards the end of the Han Dynasty, uh, there's a very famous story uh, called Yi Dou De Liang Zhou, which translates into um, uh, sort of 26 bottles of wine, roughly 20 liters of wine, um, gets you the state of Liang Zhou. So the story goes, uh, this is in the uh, official history as well. There was a very corrupt eunuch uh, who held a lot of power because eunuchs uh, were very close to the emperor and close to the heart of power. So a very powerful eunuch uh, was bribed by a guy called Meng Tuo uh, with 20 liters of wine. And in return for that bribe, um, he, uh, Meng Tuo was given um, the state governor post for this Liangzhou, which is um, a, a part of uh, the Han Dynasty uh, in present day uh, parts of Gansu, Ningxia, uh, Shanxi, so, so sort of central west, northwest of China. And Liangzhou, just to give you a sense of how big it is, it's slightly bigger than New Zealand. <laughs> it's slightly bigger than New Zealand uh, at the time with a population of around 1 million people. Right, so this tells you how expensive grape wine was, right? 26 bottles roughly of wine gets you uh, a, a post, a ministerial post uh, of an area the size of New Zealand. <laughs> so wine was very, very expensive indeed at that time, very rare. But also it shows you um, towards the end of the uh, Han Dynasty how corrupt um, the government was. So Yi Dou De Liang Zhou, has become this phrase uh, to either uh, uh, comment on corruption <laughs> or um, it, it would be a, um, um, uh, a compliment to how good the wine is, right? If you say a wine is worth Liangzhou, that means this wine is absolutely stunning. <laughs> so this is a phrase that could be used uh, in two different uh, ways. So, after the Han Dynasty, of course, being a corrupt um, uh, uh, empire towards the end, um, it was then replaced um, by a three kingdom period where the um, fiefdoms, the, the warlords, uh, rose up in power against the central power. And eventually, um, the, the uh, China uh, became um, a split state among three uh, main powers, right? So eventually, uh, the winner uh, during this three kingdom period of struggle, um, um, the winner was Cao Pi, right? Cao Pi, Wei Wen Di, Cao Pi. So Cao Pi and his father Cao Cao, who was one of the most famous Chinese warlords, they were both lovers of grape wine. They loved grape wine. And Cao Pi wrote this really interesting edict to his medics, right? So again, the aim of this is really to tell his medic, uh, his doctors, his court physicians, um, that grape wine is good for your health, <laughs> potentially to, to argue that he, he should be allowed to have as much as, as he wants, <laughs> I suppose, right? So this is an edict to all medics. And he, I, I think this is a wonderful tasting note, you know, uh, tasting notes are very hard to come by in ancient China, but I think this is uh, perhaps the best one, right? So he commented that that grape wine is sweet, but not sugary, acidic, but not sharp, cooling, but not cold, long in taste and abundant in juice, right? So I think this is uh, really a perfect description of a good wine, a well-made wine, right? And he goes on to say that actually grape wine allows one to inebriate well, yet sober up easily, right? So that's perfect. <laughs> that's the sort of state you want to be in, you know, when you're drunk. So, gan er bu yi, suan er bu cui, leng er bu han, wei chang zhi duo, shan zui er yi xing, right? So this to me is the best tasting note uh, in, in the history of China. And um, 
uh, the Three Kingdom period, of course, many of you might know through the the, um, the novel. There's a very uh, famous historical novel called the, uh, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. But also some of you uh, might know it from uh, various computer games, <laughs> right? So Dynasty Warrior being one of them. So Cao Pi, you know, that's the official portrait and that's him as a, as a hero in Dynasty Warrior. So take your pick <laughs> which one you might be more familiar with. Um, and in, in the meantime, the Romans have started to um, notice that oak, oak barrels, which were used um, to transport and to st store wines, actually imparted really pleasant effects on the wine itself. Right? So prior to uh, the, uh, the popularity of oak barrels, uh, wines were mainly stored and transported in amphoras. Right? But around this time, circa 200 AD, um, oak barrel was starting to be used more and more by the Romans and spread it uh, around um, via the Roman Empire. So fast forward a little bit. We, we said up until um, that point, grape wine was very expensive. You know, it was only enjoyed by the elite and by the rich. Um, but then moving on to Tang Dynasty, um, we started to see that grape wine was becoming uh, more accessible, more accessible to the common people, right? Um, and especially a lot of poetry. Why do we know this? Is because a lot of Tang poetry started to talk about grape wine. Um, so here again, let's um, we can explore, you know, uh, wine history of wine and how it was enjoyed um, through poetry, through uh, literature. And uh, the most famous uh, poet of the day during Tang Dynasty is Li Bai. So Li Bai wrote this poem called Xiangyang Ge, and um, he mentioned, looking out to the Han River with this green color of a duck's head, just like newly made unfiltered grape wine. And if this river turns into spring wine, the leaves and the sediments would build a mound, right? So in his poem, we can, we can gauge several pieces of very valuable information. So first of all, um, he seems to uh, like grape wine with very deep green color. So it must be some sort of, I suppose, a white wine, <laughs> but, but very green in color. Um, and he says, oh, this just looks like the river, the, the water um, of Han River looks just like unfiltered grape wine. And um, he also mentions lease and sediments. This is very interesting um, because what this means is that um, the, at the time, so lease, um, the, the word for lease in China is not just east as we would understand these days, right? It also could be um, a type of inducer, fermentation inducer used in traditional Chinese winemaking. So it's chu in Chinese. So this is a, um, a mixture of yeast, but also of certain microbial and uh, grain uh, mixture. And it's used mainly for um, uh, starting the fermentation of grain-based uh, wines, right? Because grains have less sugar than grapes and fruit. So um, in order to start the fermentation process, um, it needs a bit more help. Right, to get the fermentation process started. So we use this thing called chu uh, in chi Chinese uh, to start the fermentation process. So this kind of suggests to us, actually, by the time of the Tang Dynasty, grape wine was already being made with uh, fairly indigenous winemaking methods using this type of um, Chinese style fermentation starter. Right. So this fermentation starter is still used today in Japanese sake. So Japanese sake use something called koji. And koji is exactly um, the technology of Chinese uh, chu. <laughs> and and uh, koji was um, a technology um, that went from China into Japan. So 
Um, from this poem, we can first gauge that, you know, Li Bai uh, is drinking some kind of uh, white wine, I suppose, but with a green tinge. Um, and also this wine is unfiltered. Um, and the fact that uh, it's made with um, uh, this fermentation starter. Right, so very, very insightful piece of poetry here. And of course, if we talk about Tang Dynasty, uh, we must talk about Lady Yang, Yang Guifei. She embodies um, the peak of uh, Tang Dynasty, right? And possibly the peak of um, civilization at that time, you know, Tang Dynasty Chang'an, the capital, ancient capital at that time, uh, was the most prosperous uh, metropolis uh, of the world. Right. And Yang Guifei is right at the pinnacle um, of that period. You know, she was the most beloved um, wife um, of the emperor, and um, and her beauty is still celebrated today. She's uh, uh, named as one of the four greatest beauties of China. Right. So uh, Li Bai um, on one occasion wrote three pieces of poetry to be set to song. Um, for Yang Guifei. So on this particular occasion, um, the, the emperor and Yang Guifei were uh, enjoying the royal garden and uh, admiring the peonies in the garden. And then the emperor summoned um, musicians uh, to play songs. And then the emperor said, well, you know, we have such a beautiful lady here and beautiful flowers. We can't possibly sing old songs. We must have new lyrics. Um, so he summoned Li Bai to the palace uh, to, to compose poetry on the spot to be set to song uh, for Lady Yang to sing and to dance. So all this is a, a wholly in, impromptu session uh, of poetry writing and of um, music making uh, in the palace. And um, there's a preface to uh, Li Bai's three poems dedicated to the beauty of Lady Yang. And uh, in the preface, it says, uh, Lady Yang was holding a wine glass studded with seven treasures and filled with grape wine from Liangzhou, right? So very specific, again, uh, grape wine is mentioned. And Liangzhou grape wine was said to be Yang Guifei's favorite. So she led the songs with smiles and full of feelings and the emperor improvised on his jade flute, right? So the emperor was playing music and Yang Guifei was singing and dancing to the poems that Li Bai wrote on the spot for her. So very beautiful scene. And it just embodies um, the pinnacle of Tang Dynasty uh, culture, right? But then far away from the palace and from these luxury living, you also have the frontier soldiers trying to protect Tang Dynasty from the invasions um, of the Huns from, from the, uh, from, from the uh, people on horseback in the grass steppes <laughs> to the west and north of China. And during Tang Dynasty, um, China was fairly successful in fending off these uh, uh, border inflictions and even managed to push out its frontier um, westwards and northwards. So um, grape wine was found um, uh, around the frontiers as well as, uh, you know, for the soldiers to enjoy, uh, to boost the morale, right? So here's a very, very famous poem uh, by Wang Han called Liangzhou Ci. So Liangzhou is a famous wine-making region. And the very first line, this is one of the most famous lines of poetry in China that most Chinese people would know. Uh, and it says Pu Tao Mei Jiu Ye Guang Bei, which means fine grape wine glistens in the cup of evening light, right? So fine grape wines made from Liangzhou is what the frontier soldiers um, are enjoying. So just as they were about to enjoy the wine, the sound of pipa summons them for battle. So the soldier says, well, if I should lie drunken on the battlefield, Pray, sir, do not mock me, for since the time of old, how many do return from the frontiers of war? Right, so suddenly the mood changes a bit. 
But again, this is highly um, telling for us, right? To, to know the fact that um, the, the frontier soldiers were being rewarded uh, with, uh, with fine grape wine. So clearly from since Han, Han Dynasty to Tang Dynasty, we can see grape wine has become much more popular and accessible uh, through, throughout society. And there are other poems that suggest, you know, uh, grape wine um, are sometimes used as um, dowries uh, for girls when we get uh, when they get married, um, or grape wine. A lot of um, uh, foreigners, you know, uh, along the Silk Road, a lot of merchants will come to the capital Chang'an, which is present day Xi'an in China, to set up wine shops and sell wines. And there are also wine taverns filled with um, um, uh, girls playing songs and music, setting uh, poetry to music while the customer uh, enjoyed wine, right? So at this time, you can tell that wine culture um, was very much linked with uh, poetry, music, you know, the whole entire cultural scene uh, of the Tang Dynasty. And in the meantime, <laughs> um, court in Charlemagne, so the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne um, as King of the Franks gave um, a, a, a hill uh, in Coton to, um, to grow grape wines. And today it is one of the most revered um, appellation uh, for white Chardonnay wines uh, in Burgundy. Right? So uh, Coton Charlemagne uh, was sort of formed around the time of Tang Dynasty. And the story goes that um, uh, Charlemagne um, quite liked red wine as well, but it would stain his uh, white, long white beard, uh, which his wife objected to because it doesn't look very kingly. You know? <laughs> so, so she encouraged him to, uh, to make white wine instead. So he did some research and found this region of Coton to be very suitable for white wines. And so ever since then, it, it's essentially famous for, uh, for making white wines. And um, the Song Dynasty, which followed Tang Dynasty, again pushed grape wine um, to um, another high, really. So during Song Dynasty, um, again, tavern culture, you know, uh, food and drink and song and dance, they were all part of the same cultural scene. And Song Dynasty in particular, people were very, um, they cared a lot about um, how, how to serve, serve wine correctly. And um, here we have a very famous um, poet, again, Su Shi. So Su Shi, he was, um, he was a politician, very prominent politician but he was also a famous uh, poet, um, philosopher, artist, calligrapher. Um, you know, he really, he was very good at everything, including making wine and cooking. You know, he, he called himself a old glutton. So here in one of his um, uh, poems, he, he, um, he said, Glassware from the South, the South Seas is the thing for the wines from Liangzhou, which means Liangzhou grape wine um, is uh, held in high esteem and therefore it must be served in glassware from the South Seas. So South Seas tend to just mean um, uh, imported, you know, um, it, uh, it's, it's imported, it's quite exotic and it's, um, it's um, um, uh, it's expensive to match the wine from Yangzhou. And around Song Dynasty, we've got uh, in the UK, in England, uh, in England specifically that the Doomsday's book uh, recorded 42 vineyard locations um, in England. So this is interesting. So we're seeing a um, uh, the rise of the English wine in recent years, right? The English sparkling wine in particular uh, are really um, uh, getting people excited. But actually in, in the Doomsday's book, um, there were 42 vineyard locations, <laughs> right? And this um, correspond roughly to the Song Dynasty. So 
So Tang was famous for poetry, and Song Dynasty was famous for lyrics called Ci. And when we come to Yuan Dynasty, um, uh, Yuan Opera became all the rage, right? So Yuan Dynasty, um, uh, we have a lot of evidence uh, from different plays and operas uh, that starts to mention grape wine. And around this time, you also have very famous painters here uh, on the top. You can see uh, a very beautiful um, uh, ink painting, Chinese traditional ink painting of uh, grape wines by Wen Ruguan. Um, so Yuan Dynasty, again, uh, is, is where um, um, grape wine was becoming very, very uh, accessible, uh, even even common families, you know, will be able to enjoy grape wine and be able to uh, to comment on the quality of grape wine. So Yuan Dynasty, of course, is a is a Mongol dynasty, right? So at this point in time in China, uh, the Mongol Empire uh, has taken over almost a third of the the entire landmass uh, of the world. So grape wine from Europe, from the far west part of the Mongol Empire were being brought into uh, China. And at this point in time, the capital has already moved to Beijing. So it's called Dadu at the time, uh, meaning uh, grand capital, right? So Beijing was the capital, but wines from the west were brought in um, uh, as tribute to the Mongol Empire to the emperor of Yuan, who, you know, um, and, um, and Dadu uh, at the time was said to have um, very vast wine cellars in the palace um, and uh, kumis, which is a type of alcoholic fermented uh, horse milk, right? Kumis and grape wine were held to be the most esteemed drinks of court. Um, and Yuan Dynasty, why? Why was it so um, um, favorable for the wine industry? There's also another reason, uh, which is the Yuan government had a very um, uh, preferential tax treatment for grape wine. So grain-based wine, because the, the, um, the ingredients um, is rice, essentially, and rice is a staple food crop, right? So making wine from rice, you know, you have to ensure there's a good harvest, you know, people won't starve, that that has to be uh, the premise before you would make wine with grains, right? So grains is a, um, uh, making wine from grain directly competes with um, grains used for food crop, whereas grapes, um, you know, it's, um, it's not a food crop, really. It's not an essential food crop. So Yuan Dynasty had a very favorable tax treatment uh, for wine, you know, made from grape rather than uh, grains. So uh, grain-based wine were taxed much higher uh, than grape wines. And that really uh, um, helped uh, people to, um, to favor grape wines, essentially. So Grape wine during Yuan Dynasty uh, really reached a peak in terms of um, its commercial uh, appeal and spread. And another really interesting point um, from Yuan Dynasty literature is um, the mention of burying grape vines, right? So you may know that in northern part of China uh, in the winter, um, the uh, the grapevines have to be buried, right? But this is not a new phenomenon. You know, it's not something that people just figured out in the last uh, century. <laughs> you know, um, here we have a um, a book, a collection of agricultural practices. So this was um, commissioned by the court as an official uh, documentation uh, of good agricultural practices. And here it mentioned very specifically that vines are not cold resistant by nature. If not buried, it will die, right? And because the central part of the, the heart of um, uh, the, the government um, or the most um, uh, prosperous part of China at that time is still uh, the north part of China, really. So that's why, you know, they, they would 
um, they would notice, you know, that in winter in the northern part of China, um, vines cannot really survive the winter. Um, yeah, so this, this was published in 1273. So during Yuan Dynasty, of course, you know, the one of the very famous uh, meeting was be between Marco Polo and Kublai Khan uh, in China, in, in Beijing, in Dadu. So Marco Polo traveled all the way to, to Beijing to meet, uh, to meet the Khan. And in his, uh, in his uh, journal, Marco Polo noted that the Khan was uh, a great drinker. You know, he was a uh, very, uh, he can drink a lot. <laughs> and he drank kumis and he drank wine. And at the time, during Yuan Dynasty, uh, we also started to have um, uh, more distilled uh, wines. So brandy uh, started to appear in fairly large quantities now as well. So you can see the alcohol level are uh, starting to go up. And also uh, being a Mongol ruled empire, you know, Mongols are very famous for their ability to drink. So um, starting from the very heart of um, government, you know, in the court, you started to see this, um, uh, this um, uh, forced drinking sort of phenomenon, right? So before Yuan Dynasty, drinking was fairly civilized, right? So we've got this concept, um, which is central to Confucian thinking, which says that, so Confucius said that um, um, you should only drink uh, up to um, up to uh, well before you lose uh, form, right? Confucius says, don't drink beyond the point that you would start to lose form, right? And usually Confucius uh, Confucian uh, teaching tells us that usually three cups of wine um, would suffice for ceremony, and they emphasize on the importance of ceremony. So wine is to them, to the Confucian school, is not something to uh, get drunk with, right? It is completely to serve um, ceremonial purposes, to show respect to, um, to ancestors, to gods, and to elders and to the seniors, right? So Confucian uh, thinking have always told us three cups of wine would be enough uh, as gestures, as ceremonial gestures, as rituals, right? So, um, so usually if even today you can still see that uh, around around the banquet table uh, we tend to do three toasts right um, and that's where it came from but um, during the yuan uh, dynasty period uh, the mongol court started to uh, force people to drink right because they have this um uh, this idea that uh, wine um, is the sh is a show of hospitality, right? So, so the more I offer to my guests, the more generous and open I am. So I have to just insist on my guests to drink more and more and more and more, and until you know the guest is just like flat out. And um, there are quite a lot of court uh, documentation uh, that uh, mentions you know some minister, uh, especially. Uh, the, the uh, native Chinese ones who cannot drink as much as the Mongols, <laughs> you know, they they were force fed a lot of alcohol and they were just um, begging for their life. Uh, and the Khan would strip them off their hats and their ceremonial rope, which would be a terrible insult in those times, right? It's basically saying, well, you are unfit for your rank if you can't hold your alcohol, etc. Uh, so Yuan Dynasty, we started to see this um, um, unfortunate <laughs> um, custom um, of force feeding alcohol to your guests. And unfortunately, that is still uh, visible today, very much alive in um, uh, the banquet culture, banqueting culture of China. You know, we're still doing this. We're still uh, toasting uh, guests endlessly, you know, um, to encourage them to drink more. And um, yeah, so, so this, started around Yuan Dynasty um, and also with distilled liquor uh, being popular as well. Um, you know, alcohol um, started to, to, uh, to 
deviate from um, the previous dynasties where it was very much uh, to do with making poetry and music and um, all things um, uh, civilized. <laughs> right? So here I'll just quickly mention about uh, wineware of China. So historically, um, um, as I was mentioning, wine was uh, very much part of a, a ritual, you know, to to um, to give to show respect or give thanks or to pray to ancestors and gods. And really, the the, the rise of the Bronze Age in China had a lot to do with the need uh, for various ceremonial wineware. So a lot of the bronze uh, where that's um, uh, being excavated um, were wine vessels, right? But they tend to be uh, for grain-based wines. But if we're going to look at uh, grape wine specifically, we can see that um, Chinese people in ancient times, they were very particular with serving grape wines in the right sort of vessels as well. So here you can see um, on the right, um, this is a tomb mural from uh, Princess Fangling, which is a Tang Dynasty princess. So here it basically de depicts all the luxury and all the things that she enjoyed. And here is a picture of a lady in waiting, holding a, a wine pitcher and a glass. That's a very specifically a, 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 a wine glass. Right, so, and we, we've also found along the Silk Road um, examples of these um, wine pitchers with very European figures on them, um, again, uh, brought over through the Silk Road. And then you have things like this on the left, uh, which is a Persian wine goblet, again, uh, brought in from the Silk Road. Right, so this type of goblet and glasses um, were very specific for wine drinking. And then by the time of Yuan Dynasty, um, you're starting to see a lot of these tall stemmed wine cups. So this particular wine uh, one is called Red and Glaze, right? This Red and Glaze um, is a, a type of uh, wine glass. And you sort of almost wonder if it's for red wine, you know, <laughs> being made uh, to look like um, a, a glass with red wine in it, with this particular glazing technique as well. So moving on from the Mongol Yuan Dynasty, we go to the Ming Dynasty. So Ming Dynasty, again, uh, was um, a, a Han, uh, so native Chinese uh, ruled dynasty, and they tried to back paddle a lot to restore Confucian decorum. <laughs> and um, so during Ming Dynasty, there was a, a slight um, uh, 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 pullback uh, in terms of uh, drinking behavior, right? And also Ming Dynasty um, is very famous for um, um, a encyclopedia of uh, Chinese medicine written by Li Shizhen uh, called the Ben Cao Gao Mu Compendium of material medica. So in Ben Cao Gamu, and actually several uh, Chinese medicinal journals, we find wine being mentioned uh, um, in the medical context, right? So Li Shizhen specifically uh, mentioned wine making techniques and also the um, what uh, uh, well, what wine would do for your body. You know, it loosens. Um, um, well, it, it uh, helps circulation of the blood uh, and it helps the flow of qi. Um, and what's interesting to me here is that he mentions three methods of making grape wine. One is natural fermentation, which is what the Europeans do and still do, right? So natural fermentation of grapes and uh, fermentation with inducer. So like what we've seen earlier in the poem of Li Bai, right? So. Uh, inducing with a, a mold and grain and yeast complex and distillation, brandy, making brandy. So as jiu in Chinese, you know, alcohol is a much wider term than just wine um, in English. Uh, so the production methods for jiu, you know, he, he has listed 
these three methods. And around the same time during Ming Dynasty is also the time of Shakespeare. <laughs> so Shakespeare at the time was writing, uh, good wine is a good familiar creature if it be well used, right? very much echoing what Li Shizhen was saying in his uh, Compendium of Materia Medica. Uh, he also emphasized on the fact that wine must be enjoyed in moderation. Um, if you drink too much, it will start to uh, damage your organs. Right? So again, there's an interesting echoing. <laughs> so after Ming Dynasty, we have the Qing Dynasty. The Qing Dynasty, um, the most famous perhaps of the uh, Qing emperors um, is uh, Kangxi, right? Kangxi was one of the greatest emperors um, uh, of all time, really, in Chinese history. He um, was very open-minded. He was very eager to learn, and he was very interested in, um, uh, in these Jesuit um, uh, missionar missionaries coming from France, and he employed several of them in his court to teach him uh, languages, philosophy, and mathematics, and um, uh, astronomy, etc. You know, he was very eager to learn these things. And um, so one of these uh, missionaries called Louis Lecomte, he was from Bordeaux, and he went to China uh, between 1688 and 1691. And he worked at the court of Kangxi Emperor. So during um, a period where Kangxi had a bout of illness, um, Louis Le Comte said to Kangxi, um, I, I recommend that you drink a glass of wine every day with your meal, with your evening meal, and um, see how you get on. <laughs> and apparently that cured Kangxi of his ailment. And ever since then, Kangxi Emperor uh, would have a glass of Bordeaux <laughs> with his meal. Right. And he was um, the longest reigning emperor of China. He reigned for 60 years. And so this association between health and wine, again, um, is sort of uh, reinforced by, 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 by Emperor Kangxi. And during Qing Dynasty, again, with the missionaries, with more um, interactions uh, between the West and China, uh, you're starting to see European uh, grape wine uh, being sort of all the rage, at least um, within the, the courtiers, the circle of royalties and courtiers. So European wines, which we would recognize today, um, were making the rounds in high circles in China. And of course, during Qing Dynasty, you know, the, uh, we are starting to see um, Western Westerners making inroads in China, wanting to trade, you know, wanting to um, establish uh, trade deals um, to, to export tea and silk and um, various goods. Um, and um, from a British perspective, um, in 1793, the uh, McCartney embassy went to China to meet Qianlong Emperor, right? So, um, a very historical meeting. Unfortunately, both sides felt they didn't really uh, get um, the most out of it. I suppose the Lord, uh, Lord Markani, from their side, they wanted to set up uh, trade relationships and embassy in, 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 in China, and which were all refused by Channel Emperor. And on Channel Emperor's side, there were a lot of misunderstandings. Um, he didn't really understand um, the gifts uh, that were brought to him. He didn't see the use for most of them. Uh, and um, yeah, and, and it wasn't uh, considered a success. Um, and there was all these kowtow uh, or not to kowtow sort of uh, diplomatic hot potatoes, etc. So yeah, it, 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 um, it yeah, unfortunately, um, this meeting uh, meant that McCartney went home feeling very disappointed. But then while he was in China, he managed to look around and realize, you know, China, this uh, celestial empire was actually 
um, not very well defended, you know. So he he brought along um, a, a whole entourage of people, uh, including some draftsmen, and William Alexander was one of these uh, draftsmen and made these sketches. So this is a fort at Tianjin, which is a very important port uh, and a fort that is supposed to to be well defended, right? So here's a sketch of how this fort actually looked and. You know, I can't see much of a defense <laughs> around here, right? So, so McCartney did make a point um, that actually, you know, China, uh, the British Empire, <laughs> if it wanted to, could really just blow havoc <laughs> around here. You know, it, this, this place is hardly um, uh, defended at all. Um, and the people, you know, the common people having very difficult and very poor uh, conditions, living conditions, etc. So he made these rather uh, um, sharp observations, right? And around this time, of course, not just Britain, but um, you know, the Dutch, the French, um, various U European powers were all very eager uh, to gain access and port right uh, to trade with China. And you can already tell European um, the the shipping. Power, the naval power uh, was no, was just way ahead of China at that point. So eventually, you know, um, the miscommunication, misunderstanding, etc., um, um, caused the opi two opium wars. Right. So after the first opium war, the Treaty of Nan Nanjing was signed in 1842. Right, so here we're seeing um, all these um, Western paintings of events that happened uh, in China, right, from a Western, Westerners viewpoint expressed in Western art. Um, and after 1842, the first Opium War, which was then followed by the second Opium War, which ended in uh, 1860 with more of these um, uh, uh, treaties where China is essentially signed away lands, you know, so China became a semi-colonized state while the Qing government was still uh, in power and trying to suppress uh, uprisings as well. So local uprising plus foreign invasion was really bringing the Qing government to its knees. So during this period of turmoil, um, there was a, a movement called the Westernization Movement. Um, uh, Yang Wu Yun Dong. So Yang Wu Yun Dong tried to um, learn from Western powers in terms of industrialization, in terms of uh, um, uh, science and technology, and wanting to uh, make uh, to to uh, reform China's uh, economy and uh, and uh, industries. Right. So a lot of industrial processes and, and machinery and all that sort of thing. Um, were trying uh, were, were being bought uh, by by Chinese government, um, but um, eventually um, it did not have the desired eff effect of saving China from foreign invaders. Um, it was just too little, too late by that point. But one interesting thing to notice through uh, during this uh, Westernization movement, um, a industrialized winery was founded in China in 1892 uh, by Zhang Bishi. Zhang Bishi founded the Changyu Winery in 1892 as part of this westernization movement in Shandong province. And that is uh, what we would consider today um, as the oldest uh, and first industrialized uh, Chinese winery um, of modern China. And Changyu today is still um, the largest wine brand and wine company uh, in China. And now if we fast forward quite a bit <laughs> to, um, to the 1980s, essentially. 1980s, um, Great War and Dynasty um, uh, wineries followed Changyu and they became the three largest wine companies of China, of modern China. So Great War and Dynasty came about as a result of the reform and opening up uh, policy, uh, which was introduced um, in 1978, 79, and then started to put in practice uh, uh, from the 80s. And um, uh, 
this started as um, uh, sort of joint ventures between Chinese and foreign companies, right? So uh, Dynasty um, was um, uh, the, 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 the joint venture of um, uh, Tianjin Food Group and Remy Martin, uh, which was why in the 80s and 90s, you know, uh, Remy Martin, the uh, cognacs and brandies, etc., were very popular in China. So today, uh, wine is made in China almost all over the all over the place, and this map will show you um, in relative sizes. You know the green dots. The size of the green dots indicate uh, the relative uh, planting areas, um, uh, vineyard areas um, in different regions, and the green dots are the European uh, varieties being planted. So. Vitis uh, vinifera varieties, and the red dots are these uh, Chinese indigenous grape varieties being also trialed uh, to make wine. So they could be wild grape varieties um, native to China, or some of them are crossbreeds cross uh, between Chinese varieties and European varieties. Um, and the yellow line, if you can see, um, marks the boundaries um, at which the vines will have to be buried, right? So northern China or the uh, the the, um, the dots above the yellow lines, um, all those vines in those regions will have to be buried um, over winter. So that was a very quick, <laughs> because of time, that was a very quick, um, with through of um, the, the, the grape wine history of China, just by picking some key features of each dynasty. Um, in conclusion, um, I wanted to say that um, China, we should really consider it as a new old world wine region. You know, So usually we talk about the old world versus the new world of wine, old world being you know France, Italy, Spain, or these old European wine regions, the new world, places like um, the US, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, you know, South Africa, et cetera. Um, but recently we also started to talk about new old world. So places like Greece, Turkey, um, Hungary, you know, these Middle Eastern areas where in ancient times we would refer to as the Fertile Crescent, where actually wine originated from those areas. So, uh, but only recently are becoming more commercially successful in the international uh, wine trade community. So we call them new old world. And in fact, China does belong to this category uh, of wine regions, you know, the new old world regions. So wine is not something uh, that just happened to um, become fashionable in the last 10, 20 years or so. And, in China, even as a, as a production, as a wine producing region, um, it's had a very ancient history. So I just want to end on one point about why it is, why do I think um, it is the case um, that uh, the Chinese wine history hasn't been that continuous to the point that we tend to almost forget that we have one, <laughs> right? And I think the reason for that is, um, wine is a good barometer for, um, for prosperity in China, right? Unlike tea, which had, has had a very continuous culture in China, uh, wine tend to be disrupted. Wine production gets disrupted during times of turmoil or political instability, right? Because wine is um, uh, not something you would make when there's a um, a war happening or a terrible famine going on, right? Whereas you can still manage to drink um, coarse tea. You know that's uh, what they used to say. It's it's still possible to drink coarse tea during times of turmoil, but you cannot be drinking wine <laughs> during those days, right? So throughout Chinese history, you can see with the fall and rise of dynasties, you see this uh, cyclical. Uh, behavior of the wine industry as well. So um, usually during uh, war or famine or times of uh, uncertainty, the government would 
ban uh, wine production and wine drinking because a um, it's um, wasteful of uh, human resources and uh, uh, farmland and of uh, you know uh, agricultural um, produce. Right, so they would ban the production. They would also ban the consumption because they don't want riots uh, happening after people are drunk. You know, they don't want uh, people to congregate in taverns and plot a rebellion. Right. So throughout history, you see a lot of these laws being passed to ban wine. You know, up to uh, death. You know, as a sentence. You know, it's very harsh to to to. Um, uh, prevent people from getting drunk or even drinking or making wine at all, right? So that's what tends to happen when a dynasty is in turmoil. So wine industry gets disrupted very, very aggressively uh, once in a while. And then when a dynasty becomes um, more stable, wine industry is then allowed to uh, flourish a little bit. Uh, because ultimately, uh, the government understands that wine is an excellent revenue for tax income. So you cannot ban it forever. Right? So a lot of the times, uh, wine, um, uh, the government we would even have a direct monopoly on the wine industry because it's such a lucrative source of income. So wine um, industry in inevitably uh, would flourish as the 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 the, um, the political situation improves, right? So uh, the 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 uh, prosperity of the wine industry goes hand in hand uh, with the prosperity of uh, the society, of culture, um, of economy. Right? So you do see this cyclical behavior of the wine industry, and really today we are um, at a point where you know China is emerging again out of the shadows of the Qing dynasty, of the Opium Wars, of the semi-colonial period, and, and of the initial uh, period of, of, uh, of the, the current regime, right? So it is also starting to flourish with the reform and opening up um, uh, a system uh, showing some very positive impact on the Chinese economy. Um, and therefore, it's really no surprise that the wine industry is enjoying a period of revival and renaissance. Um, so that is what I think is very interesting about the wine industry and why it is quite unique uh, and different to food or tea, for example, um, as something that could really showcase um, um, it really gives you a glimpse into um, a period, an epoch, you know, what uh, uh, the wine culture of a certain period tells you a lot about how people lived, um, their value, uh, their customs, you know, for example, wine and poetry in Tang and Song dynasty versus the, 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 the heavy drinking type of behavior that's preferred by the, the Yuan dynasty, you know, where people um, have a, a lot more capacity for drink, right? So all these are very fascinating and very uh, specific to certain periods. And um, that is why wine culture uh, is very insightful um, uh, uh, um, a glimpse into, into history and into the present day and possibly into the future as well. Okay, so I'm gonna um, wrap up there for today. Uh, so next time, um, we're going to start to look at uh, wine regions of China, right? So we're going to, um, uh, in the next four sessions, we'll cover uh, two, uh, two wine regions per session. And with each of these uh, uh, regions, we will also start to um, have a wine to represent that region. So this is um, uh, the format for the next uh, four sessions, we're going to have a mixed case. We've prepared a mixed case of six wines from six different boutique wineries of China. So these are award-winning boutique wineries of China making rather fine wines um, of China. So we're gonna start with Shandong and Shanxi province. So from Shandong, um, we have a dry red wine uh, from Treaty Port Estate, uh, which is, uh, in Penglai in, in Shandong and next to the um, 
uh, if you know the Rothschild property, you know, they've, uh, uh, they started uh, the vineyard in, in China as well. And Treaty Port is, uh, was there first, actually, and is their neighbor. And it, it's been making uh, some very interesting wines with, with um, slightly unusual blends as well. And Shanxi, uh, we're going to have a wine from Rongzi Winery. Um, so Shanxi is famous for the Lowe's Plateau, right? So this is an interesting uh, area with very specific soil type, you know, so hopefully uh, we can talk a little bit about the, the region as well. Um, and this is a Pinot Noir. So Pinot Noir is a very delicate grape, very difficult uh, to grow. So a Pinot Noir from China uh, should be should be of interest to, to any wine lovers, <laughs> really, because Pinot Noir um, uh, A is very difficult to, to grow. It needs very good condition and good care uh, to make decent wines. And also uh, different regions will impart different characters on them. So hopefully we can try uh, a Pinot Noir from China uh, from the Lowe's Plateau. And then um, the session after that, we're going to look at the area around Beijing. Uh, so Hebei, Beijing, that sort of area. And uh, we've got two white wines from that area. The first one is made from Dragon Eye. So earlier on the map, um, I said most of the uh, wine growing regions are using um, European uh, uh, varieties. But sometimes they also use Chinese varieties. So this dragon eye, actually it is still a European variety, but it came into China around 800 years ago, we think. And then um, we, we think it's now um, found mainly in China and also in Japan, actually, but not really anywhere else in Europe anymore, right? So this <laughs> has, um, China has basically adopted it as a, as, as a local variety. Um, so Dragon Eye. Um, and then we're gonna have an organic wine from Beijing with a, a very interesting blend. Then we're gonna move on to the Silk Road area uh, with wines um, made from Marceline, uh, which again is a variety that's showing great potential in China. So from Xinjiang province, uh, we're going to have a Marceline blend, um, followed by Ningxia. Ningxia is the poster child province uh, of, China, of the Chinese wine industry. It's the most well-known internationally uh, region um, for, for Chinese wines. And Jia Beilan, this particular vineyard, Helan Qingxue vineyard, they, um, they won um, a very prestigious award in 2011, and that really um, brought China to attention for the world wine trade. Um, until that point, I think a lot of people uh, didn't really know that China made wine. Uh, but after that, a wine from Ningxia won this very prestigious blind tasted uh, uh, wine trophy, um, people really started to take notice of China. So we're going to end on that one. So um, if you're interested, so the following several sections, um, sessions, we're going to um, do the webinar. But if you would like to have the mixed case um, to taste alongside with the webinar, um, you can order the wines from the Cambridge China Center website. So if you go to the wine club section, uh, you will see that you can choose the mixed case. Um, and we've managed to get a really, really, really good price for the mixed case um, and with free shipping in the UK as well. So if you want to try Chinese wines, uh, this really is the best opportunity uh, for you to try uh, six different wines from different regions um, with quite different characters as well. Um, and if you are interested in what I was talking about today, um, you can also uh, add a copy of my book with this mixed case, again, at a very uh, good price. <laughs> and um, my book is essentially talking about China um, with a wine perspective. So again, as you have noticed from the talk, um, it's not really always just about wine, but it's also about culture, it's about history and art and poetry and philosophy. So if you're interested to learn about China from 
from that sort of narrative and perspective, then maybe you would uh, enjoy the book as well. So that's the two options we have for you. Um, and if you would like to have the wines uh, available um, before the, the, the talk, the next talk, which is on the 25th of October, um, I would strongly recommend that you order as soon as you can, because we then can sort out the logistics uh, quite quickly for you, because it will take a while to get the case together to send it to you. Um, so if you want to have it by the 25th of October, um, please just do order it as soon as you can to, to make our life um, logistically also easier. So that's, that's all I have today. So thank you all. Uh, I'll pass it back to Jing Zhao for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Um, it's such an interesting talk. It's really like an interesting, very unique whirlwind tour of Chinese wine culture. Very quick, yeah, very, quick. uh, very quickly. <laughs> thousands of years yeah. of dynasties to yes. modern China. Um, so many interesting points. I never know. <laughs> like, you found the wine barrels, 200 yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. lots of interesting facts. And everybody, if you want to understand more, um, you can you notice that um, Janet, Janet in her book, The Chinese Wine Renaissance, and she did mention lots of all these different stories, dynasties, uh, Chinese uh, wine related stories in the book. Uh, that's uh, a very strong recommendation. And like Jenny just said, our next three sessions, we are going to look at some very popular Chinese wine regions. Uh, Shandong, Shanxi, Xinjiang, Ningxia, Beijing, and surrounding area, Hebei province. Um, mm. If you want to buy the mixed case to accompany those wine, wine webinars, um, you're welcome to uh, look at the details on Cambridge China Center website. And also the fifth, um, fifth session of season one, we're going to look at Chinese wine culture and Western wine culture in a comparative way. And the final session of season one, 20th of December, we'll look at sparkling wines for festival seasons. Okay, thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next session uh, in two weeks' time on the 25th October. Look at Chinese wine region, Shandong and Shanxi. Okay, thank you, thank, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. See you next time. I'm going to go retrieve your channel tomorrow.